to rising crime rates and harms the communities where they're in power. Today, our focus is related, but slightly different, because we're talking about rising crime rates and the current disorder that's taking place in our nation's capital. We'll talk about why the Congress and President rejected the supposed reform measures passed by the D.C. City Council, and the challenges faced by police and prosecutors here in the District of Columbia. If you turn on the news, unfortunately, stories about D.C. crime are everywhere. In fact, just earlier this week, local news reported that five teen boys were shot in four separate incidents during a span of 28 hours in Washington, D.C. One of these teens died. Nightly News also contains stories of tourists who have had their winter coats stolen off of their backs at gunpoint, or who have been carjacked while unloading their luggage or simply traveling the streets of D.C. And unfortunately, these news stories make sense when you look at the crime statistics. In 2022 and 2021, the district suffered more than 200 murders each year for the first time since 2003. This was up from a 20-year low of 88 homicides in 2012. And so far this year, in 2023, murders are up 14% from the same time last year. And this same, this same trend holds true across a variety of crimes. Sex abuse cases are up 111% so far this year compared to the same point last year. Motor vehicle thefts are up 104% compared to the same point last year. And to put the current crime crisis in the District of Columbia in perspective, I think there's an interesting statistic that's worth noting. So far in 2023, there have been 82 days this year. During those 82 days, there have been 1,505 cars stolen in the District of Columbia. That's up 104% from the already high number of cars stolen by this same point last year. Overall, property crime is up 27% compared to this time last year, and total crime is up 22% compared to this time last year. Juvenile offenders, in particular, get off scot-free in most cases, and when they are caught, they're rarely tried as adults, even when they commit the most violent of crimes. It was against this backdrop that the Council of D.C. adopted a radical rewrite of its criminal code over the mayor's veto that would, among other things, eliminate all mandatory minimum sentences except for first-degree murder, which it lowered, and lowered the maximum sentences for most offenses, including carjacking. Fortunately, because of the district's unique constitutional status as our nation's capital, Congress was able to step in at the behest of concerned district residents, many of whom are Democrats, and override on a bipartisan basis this dangerous criminal code rewrite. On Monday of this week, March 20th, 2023, President Joe Biden signed this override into law. Leading the effort in the Senate to help shed light on this insanity and to restore law and order to the district was Tennessee Senator Bill Haggerty. Senator Haggerty was sworn into office in January of 2021 after previously serving as U.S. Ambassador to Japan and completing a successful career in state government and a career in the private sector. Senator Haggerty holds undergraduate and law degrees from Vanderbilt University, and we're very pleased to be joined today by Senator Haggerty. Please join me in welcoming to the stage. Well, Senator, thank you for joining me today. I appreciate you taking the time to be here to talk about this very important issue. And I thought we could start our conversation today by briefly talking about how did you get involved in this effort? Well, being involved in the effort is exercise of my constitutional duties and authority. Uh, I'm a member of the United States Senate. Congress has oversight responsibility for the district. But importantly, I'm the ranking member on the subcommittee in the Appropriations Committee that has oversight for the district's budget. Um, taking a hard look at what was happening here at the district, uh, it, it, it's extremely concerning. Uh, the, the attitude that's been displayed, uh, I think everybody that, uh, that lives or works here, and of course I only do that on a temporary basis, but is concerned about the crime wave 
that is taking place here. I worry about my own staff. I certainly worry about my constituents that come to visit here. And let's not forget, this is the Federal District of Columbia. This is our nation's capital. And we all have an investment in, in, in this capital. We need to see it as, as a beacon of, of freedom and hope and liberty, not as an embarrassment to the nation. Right. Yet the D.C. Council seemed set on a course that would be embarrassing for our nation. It would increase crime and incentivize uh, a worsening of a situation that's already far too bad. Well, you mentioned you have a constitutional obligation as a member of the Senate to oversee what happens here in the District of Columbia. Now, in the early 1970s, Congress passed the Home Rule Act, which devolved certain uh, powers back to local officials, uh, but it ultimately gave uh, the House and the Senate final say on what happens uh, here in the district. Can you explain a little bit about how the Home Rule disapproval process works and what the Senate's role is in reviewing local legislation here in the district? Zach, I thought you might ask me about this. So <laughs> I, I thought I might actually I can't just, wonder why. <laughs> I, I, I thought I might actually just uh, read the relevant section of the Home Rule Act and the Constitution. Sure. I'm going to start with the Constitution just to set the context for this. Always a good we'll, place to then, start. Then we'll go to the Home Rule Act. But Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, uh, when it's talking about the powers of Congress, and it clearly states in reference to the District of Columbia that Congress shall, quote, exercise exclusive legislation in all cases whatsoever over such district, that being the District of Columbia. Sure. Now let's go to the Home Rule Act. Um, Title VI of the D.C. Home Rule Act uh, says, notwithstanding any other provision of this act, the Congress of the United States reserves the right at any time to exercise its constitutional authority as legislature for the district by enacting legislation for the district on any subject, whether within or without the scope of legislative power granted to the council by this act. And I want to emphasize this, including legislation to amend or repeal any law enforced in the district prior to or after enact enactment of this act and any act passed by the council, hmm. squarely putting in place the uh, attempt by the D.C. Council to pass this this uh, reform, as they called it, but this change in the criminal code here in the district. Excellent. Now, I understand the disapproval process under the Home Rule Act. It, their timelines are a little bit different. The legislative process is a little bit different uh, than how legislation normally makes its way through the Senate. Can you talk a little bit about that? Certainly, Senator? and, and it, this is important. The, the resolution of disapproval that I brought about had certain privileges that does make it quite different. Um, first, because it's a criminal statute. A criminal statute has special treatment. There's a 60-day review period for that statute. Also, and I think this is most important, it's privilege, which means it gets discharged to the floor without getting stuck in committee. Hmm. This has happened to other pieces of legislation where they're stuck in his gag. This goes straight to the floor. I have the ability to do that, and it requires 51 votes, not a 60 vote. Uh, not sure. a 60 vote threshold. So those privileges um, have, you know, have made it possible for me to get this done on an expedited basis and a timely basis and not be held up by the majority leader or by committee leadership that would otherwise perhaps frustrated this. Excellent. Now, there was a dispute, I remember, with the local D.C. City Council about the timing issue of this disapproval process. I know D.C. Uh, Council Chairman Phil Mendelson, he tried to withdraw uh, the legislation at one point. I think at the time you called it a, quote, desperate, made-up <laughs> maneuver uh, by the chairman. Why do you think the D.C. City Council uh, tried to recall this piece of legislation? Well, I can say this. There's no basis in the Constitution nor in the D.C. Home Rule Act for what they proposed to do. So obviously they made it up uh, as they went along. Uh, you know, if, if Mr. Mendelson were here, he could answer that question himself, I presume. Uh, the only thing I can imagine is they had a sobering experience of realizing that not only uh, w was I against this, but they could tell that the weight of the Senate was was coming in their way. It turned out that 81 senators voted for this resolution of disapproval, a veto-proof majority in the Senate, I might add. And I think that if you looked at the polls here in the district, 72 percent of the people in the District of Columbia were with me right. on this. So perhaps reality caught up to the D.C. Council. Right. Well, I think it's worth looking at briefly. Uh, we talk a lot about what the revised criminal code would do. Uh, and it's pretty clear it would eliminate all mandatory minimum sentences except for first-degree murder. It would lower the maximum penalties 
uh, for many crimes, again, including for first degree uh, murder. And so it makes sense why so many were opposed uh, to this. And I'm curious, Senator, if you can briefly talk about uh, maybe some of the conversations you had with local residents or people who are involved in the local criminal justice system and why they thought these specific provisions would be so problematic. Well, the only conversations I had with people were people reaching out to me, thanking me for stepping up to address this. People were reaching out to me beforehand, telling me how concerned they were that this is absolutely the wrong message to send. At a time when you have escalating crime here in the district, you mentioned some of the statistics. I mean, the past three years alone, we've seen a trebling of the number of carjackings here in the district. Over 200 homicides a year in each of the past two years. And in February, when I was looking at the data, those statistics were up even 20% over the year prior. It's still accelerating. To come in at this point in time and to say, yes, we should lower the penalties for these major crimes, it sends absolutely the wrong message, a contrary message to what you need to be sending in terms of supporting law enforcement, law and order in the district. And there's something else that this uh, proposed law would have done, which I think has, has, has sort of been skimmed over by the media, but if you think about the practical implications, it's significant. It would have entitled most every misdemeanor in the district to a jury trial. The district's already backed up in terms of getting major felonies to jury trials. Can you imagine if every misdemeanor were entitled to a jury trial too? It would completely clog the system. It would lock it up. So what does a prosecutor do in that circumstance? The prosecutor is going to have to focus on the felonies. That's what, you know, th that's the most dangerous thing happening here. So the District of Columbia becomes a catch and release haven for criminal elements because they're not going to prosecute misdemeanors. That's going to be the practical result of this. Can you imagine what it would be like here in the district if no misdemeanor is prosecuted or, prosecute or, 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 or able to be prosecuted because they're not the resources to do it? That's exactly what the implications would have been had the D.C. Council gotten its way. Hmm. Well, one of the points I think that's worth emphasizing, Senator, if the district were a state, as so many have advocated for the past few years, uh, would Congress have been able to intervene uh, like it did and disapprove this resolution? Well, first I'll say this. Uh, so many people fail to read the components of the Constitution that I just read you. There is no constitutional authority for D.C. to become a state. Go all the way back to when uh, Bobby Kennedy was Attorney General. He determined that at that point in time. Uh, I think they're very creative attempts to reread the Constitution, uh, to make up laws as folks wish they would be here in Washington rather than what they say. But there is no avenue. There's no legal avenue, there's no constitutional avenue for this district, this federal district of Columbia, to be a state. The reasons that Democrats would like to see that is because they'd like to have two more members of the United States Senate. I understand the practical goal that they have. Uh, it's an aim to get more power, but a power grab is not a reason to violate the Constitution. It would take a lot more work than some people in the Democrat, you know, the Democrat side of, of, of my institution seem to believe. Well, one of the interesting data points, especially in light of this push for D.C. statehood over the past few years, is there's been a focus on state-level crime data as well. Now, my colleague, Kelly Stimson, my other colleague, Kevin Dyeratna, we've written about why state-level crime data doesn't really make sense, because crime is uh, a localized phenomenon in a lot of ways. Uh, it's, by and large, a red herring. But one interesting statistic that I do think is worth noting in light of today's uh, discussion if the District of Columbia, and this is from a report uh, Cully, Kevin, and I uh, co-authored, if the district were a state, uh, the District of Columbia would by far have the highest per capita murder rate of any state uh, in our country, much, much higher uh, than the next highest uh, state. And I think that's just an interesting data point showing uh, that there is a significant crime problem here in the, uh, the District of, of Columbia. I am curious, as a follow-up to your earlier discussion about the timelines under the Home Rule Act, um, you know, that seems like a relatively quick time frame uh, to act in many cases. 60 days uh, in cases of uh, local legislation involving criminal law matters, 30 days, as I understand, uh, for other pieces of legislation. And, and those aren't privileged in the way that, 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 a, that a criminal statute modification would be. Mm. So my question then is, Senator, if Congress is unable uh, to act within those time frames, what other tools or mechanisms are available either to you and your colleagues in the Senate or to folks in the House to counteract some of this radical legislation coming well, out of D.C.? As I mentioned, I'm the ranking member of the Appropriations Subcommittee that has oversight for the district. So this has been used in the past as well. You just don't fund 
certain areas that uh, the District of Columbia might be requesting funding for. Uh, that, that's one way to do it. There are probably a number of other ways we could look at it, but I think the most responsible way is the way myself and my team have handled this. We're going to review these quickly, mm. and we're going to uh, you know, apply our constitutional discretion as necessary. Uh, the district needs to get its act back in order, and rather than, in, you know, rather than taking steps that would encourage more crime and more laws, laws in the district, I hope that they go back to the drawing board now mm -hmm. and come up with something that would actually strengthen the deterrence mechanisms that are available to them and make this district a safer place. Well, you mentioned that they should go back to the drawing board. I noticed uh, D.C. Mayor Muriel Bowser, she released her budget for next year uh, earlier this week. As part of that budget, she proposed eliminating the Criminal Code uh, Reform Commission uh, that kind of put forward many of these radical uh, proposals. And so I guess, what do you think happens next? Do you think D.C. will go back to the drawing board? Uh, do you think they'll try to break this up into pieces? I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts. Well, I, I think the mayor has clearly had an awakening because she vetoed right. these provisions that, are, that have been so troubling. Uh, and I, to see her come back and take this commission down to defund it, uh, I think is an appropriate move. Clearly, this commission was far and away, uh, you know, on a different planet than the majority of residents in the district, and certainly, I think, a majority of Americans. If you look at the vote that we cast in the Senate, 81 members of the Senate, 81 percent of the Senate stood with me on this. Right. I think uh, America has had it with this whole defund the police uh, movement, soft on crime. Uh, being critical of law enforcement, being non-supportive of law enforcement. I think certainly in Tennessee, we want to support law enforcement. We want to enhance their capabilities, let them know that we appreciate them, not defund them, sure. uh, and, and not make their jobs harder. So I, I think that message is beginning to filter into the district, and I, I'm encouraged by the actions of the mayor in terms of her budget priorities. I am curious. You know, in other contexts, uh, particularly with the Congressional Review Act, if Congress steps in, they disapprove a, a legislative rulemaking action. In some instances, then, um, that agency is prohibited from taking that same action unless Congress explicitly uh, approves uh, future action. And so I'm curious, since the D.C. City Council's so-called reform effort was so abysmal, uh, what role should Congress play as they consider future legislation? Should Congress step in, hold hearings, and pass a revised criminal code? Uh, should members of the local D.C. Council come testify in front of Congress about potential reforms? What do you think this process looks like going well, forward? All of the above are possible because the provisions that I read you are actually quite broad in terms of our constitutional authority and our, 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 the D.C. Home Rule Act uh, authorities. What I would hope would happen, though, is that the structures that have been put in place here in the district sober up and take a clear-eyed view of what the challenges truly are, and rather than trying to send some sort of woke signaling to demonstrate how progressive they are, they actually think about the safety and well-being of the citizens here and the people that come from my state and every other state to visit this great city. And if they take that sort of approach and perspective, if they come back to us with something that's responsible, I think we'll have a, a process that will begin to work again. Mm -hmm. If they want to stay on this same, this, this same vector, I presume the mayor will continue to try to veto it, and uh, I'll be in the same position uh, that I have been with, with respect to these irresponsible laws. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm hopeful as well, but uh, I know policing is also a na major issue in the district right now. Uh, unfortunately, the D.C. Council, they defunded the police, uh, leading to what one uh, local D.C. Council member, Charles Allen, said was, quote, the biggest reduction to MPD, that's the local D.C. police force I've ever seen. And he said he was doing this in the name of racial justice. Uh, there was also uh, onerous legislation uh, that was recently passed, uh, putting certain restrictions on local D.C. police. I think uh, D.C. Council Chairman Phil Mendelson compared it to the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, uh, which did not pass at the federal level and had several problematic provisions. Uh, I know in the House there's been a disapproval resolution introduced uh, to disapprove this uh, police reform legislation. Uh, and so I'm curious, assuming it passes the House within the prescribed time frames, do you think it could pass the Senate too? The, the answer is uh, it, it, it could, but I haven't had a chance to thoroughly go through this yet, so I'm, I, I'm not at a position at this point to take, uh, to, to, take a, to, to give you my, my, my view in terms of how I'd come down on it. But again, I, I'll come back to the fact that we have broad authority here under the Constitution. Uh, I hope that message is received loud and clear by the District of Columbia. Excellent. I did want to ask you about a tweet uh, you sent earlier this week. Uh, it was in response to President Joe Biden. He signed the disapproval resolution uh, earlier this week. And when he signed it, 
uh, you said it was a victory for law and order, and that it sends a message that resonates through crime-ridden cities across America. Uh, so I'm curious, what other actions can we hope to see from Congress that will help strengthen safety and security across our nation and continue to send this message? Well, one action I can assure you of is a piece of legislation that Senator Marsha Blackburn and I introduced in the last Congress, and I intend to reintroduce again, that will reprogram some of these uh, Inflation Reduction Act, the so-called Inflation Reduction Act funds, uh, specifically the $80 billion that were carved out for increasing IRS enforcements and hiring you know, tens of thousands of IRS agents. Instead of doing that, using those funds to recruit, to train, to work on the retention of police, to enhance the tools that police have available to them, to address specific shortfalls uh, that, they're, that they're experiencing right now in terms of their labs not being up to speed for, for, for creation of evidence, um, to, to deal with specific challenges that we have with respect to fentanyl coming into our country, with human trafficking. Uh, that's what you can expect to see from me and from Senator Blackburn as we come into this Congress. And if you look at what's happening at our southern border right now, we have complete chaos right there. And if you look at the number of deaths across America, you know, we've had over 100,000 deaths uh, in this past year, over 70,000 of them due to fentanyl. Again, the precursors coming from China, the CCP in partnership with criminal cartels that control the entirety of the northern border of Mexico, those cartels are actually operating in America right now. Uh, I was pressing the Secretary of State yesterday. A number of my colleagues have been doing the same thing. We need to be sanctioning these organizations. We need to be calling out China for their role in this. And I asked yesterday to Secretary Blinken, what's stopping President Biden from picking up the phone today and calling Xi Jinping and going through the list of consequences, including sanctions, ec stiff economic sanctions, if he doesn't stop sending the precursor chemicals and fentanyl into Mexico or America where they can kill our kids. Fantastic. And just to continue on that point, uh, very quickly, if you could tell us, you know, given your work on the D.C. crime bill reform effort, how has what's happening at our southern border in terms of human trafficking, in terms of fentanyl, what impact is that having on our local communities? So I talk with sheriffs across my home state of Tennessee every day, police chiefs across the state as well. Uh, what they tell me is that each month is worse than the month prior in terms of the inflow of illicit drugs and in terms of the death by drug overdose. They tell me that the toughest call that they have to make is to a mother or a grandmother to let them know that their son or grandson their daughter or granddaughter won't be coming home because somehow they tied into this poison that's being shipped across our southern border. You can barely get this administration to even acknowledge that the problem exists. And the number one killer of young Americans between the age, ages of 18 and 45 today is death by drug overdose. And this administration wants to ignore it because they want to preserve the chaos at the border to allow this incredible flow of illegal human traffic across that border because they perceive some advantage in the long term, I presume, in terms of shifting the electorate in America. Well, Senator, I know you are very busy today uh, with everything that's going on in the Senate uh, and in Washington. Uh, before we end our conversation here today, is there any final thoughts you would like to leave the folks either here in the room or the folks watching online, not only about what's happening here in the District of Columbia in terms of crime, uh, but what's happening across our country in many cities? Well, I, I want to let you know that each day I wake up realizing and appreciating the fact that we live in the most exceptional nation in the world. My previous job before coming to the Senate, I was the ambassador to Japan. As a U.S. ambassador, you have a great privilege to represent this nation, and you think about it perhaps in a different way when you're overseas, and you can compare America to any other country. We are the greatest and the, and, and, and the most exceptional nation in the world. We need to remember that. And rather than take away our competitive advantage, rather than destroy our strengths, which these, you know, these defund the police sort of movements are doing, or you know, attacks on our economy that some of my colleagues want to bring about, or anything that might weaken us in the international realm, we need to be speaking from a position of strength. And we're only strength, we only have strength abroad if we're strong here at home. In our first duty, as legislators, as leaders, is the safety of the American public. And if we don't wake up every day thinking about that and doing something about it when it's in jeopardy, we are failing at our job. I intend to do my job. 
to keep this nation safe and to work hard to push back against this crazy defund the police movement, uh, these efforts to basically coddle criminals and forget about victims. We need to stand for a strong America at every turn, and it starts with the safety of our public. Well, thank you so much for your excellent work on this bill uh, related to the District of Columbia, Senator. Thank you for your work more broadly on protecting public safety around the country. And thank you so much for taking time to join us here today. Please join me in giving Senator Haggerty a hand. Take care. Thank you. Uh, my colleague, Cully Stimson, uh, who will lead our second panel. Cully is my colleague and co-author of our forthcoming book on rogue prosecutors that will be out in June of this year. Cully is a senior fellow here in the uh, Heritage, Fa Heritage Foundation's Mies Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. Uh, before coming to Heritage, he served uh, for a number of years as a state, federal, and military prosecutor and military judge as well. And so he has a lot of great insights into criminal justice issues. And Cully, I'll turn the floor over to you. Well, thank you very much, Zach. And I'd invite uh, Greg and Jesse to come to the stage, please. Um, and while they're doing that, let me take uh, a moment and introduce our two distinguished guests, uh, one of whom I've known since we were... Start, we started together in the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. on the same day in the same recruiting class. I don't know if we well, But I think it was about two decades ago. Sometime. Yeah, yeah. I think it was in the last century. Um, it was, actually. Yeah, yeah, we will. Not yeah, quite. Yeah. Um, and uh, Jessie is a partner uh, at Scar Skadden Arps now. She's had a distinguished uh, career, among other jobs she's had. She was the U.S. Attorney for the District of Columbia. She worked in the National Security yeah, Department. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. I'm failing again. Excuse me, I'm <laughs> sorry. The National Security Glad Division of the you. Justice yeah. Department. Uh, and she's also worked in senior other positions at DOJ, and including uh, time in the private sector at another firm. Um, uh, Greg Pemberton is the chairman of the D.C. for coming today. He's been a sworn peace officer for 18 years. Uh, and so he represents uh, the voice. Uh, and is the face of the DC Metropolitan Police Department here in the District of Columbia. So we're delighted to have both of you uh, here. Jesse, uh, let me start with you. Uh, you were the U.S. Attorney uh, from 2017 to 2020, which for those who don't know, that's the Chief Prosecutor for the District of Columbia. And that office, as we know, is unique because among the 93 U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, it's not only the federal prosecutor, but it's the DA. Uh, no other U.S. Attorney's Office is the DA. And so that office tries cases not only in the D.C. Superior Court. Greg, do you need a microphone? There you go. Uh, but also in the Federal District Court in the District of Columbia. Um, most of those cases, as we know, go to the Superior Court. Tell us more about the office and its unique nature and, and how you, when you were the boss, and you're not speaking for the department now, or Matt Graves, the current U.S. Attorney, how you decided where to take a case and why. All right, well, first of all, is this working? I'm not sure whether it is. Press a button. I'm the worst uh, tech person ever. I think this is what you want to try to All right. Share. There you go. And we'll get this fixed. Go ahead. All right, well, first of all, it's really a pleasure to be here, and it's always a pleasure to see Greg Pemberton, who um, I think we worked with back in the day, um, many, many, many years ago, more years probably than we want to admit. So um, as Cully said, the U.S. Attorney's Office here in the district is unique because it is both the primary local prosecutor as well as a traditional U.S. Attorney's Office. On the federal side, the office handles what you typically think of as federal crimes like international terrorism, um, wire fraud, mail fraud, public corruption, that sort of thing. Uh, but the vast majority of cases by number are brought in Superior Court, um, and that's because the U.S. Attorney's Office here is also the local prosecutor, the equivalent of the Commonwealth's Attorney in Virginia, the state's attorney in Maryland, DAs um, all around the country. And that covers everything from drug possession, shoplifting, other misdemeanors, all the way up uh, to carjackings, sexual assaults, uh, robberies, and homicides. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is that 
federal jurisdiction only covers a very small amount of, of um, criminal activity. So when you think about crime writ large, uh, most of what comes to mind, except for these kind of very specific crimes that are covered by the U.S. Code, um, are enforced by state prosecutors in other parts of the country and by the U.S. Attorney's Office Superior Court Division here and prosecuted in the local court, which is uh, the D.C. Superior Court. Um, so again, um, the vast, vast majority um, of um, um, criminal offenses here in the district are quote-unquote local crimes that are prosecuted in Superior Court. The office's partner um, for the vast majority of those offenses is the Metropolitan Police Department, of which um, Mr. Pemberton is a distinguished alum. And in addition to, let's stick with you, uh, because I think it's important for people to get a feel for the various agencies that uh, our old office partnered with. Mm -hmm. The Metropolitan Police, obviously, the Washington Field Office of the FBI, mm -hmm. uh, the Secret Service, um, and then other lesser known police agencies. Yeah, I, I, it's amazing because when I was the U.S. Attorney, we would do a monthly meeting with um, all of the law enforcement agencies within the district um, that were willing to attend. And there were several dozen of them and everybody from, I mean, the Metropolitan Police Department, who everybody knows, but the Secret Service, which also has a uniform division, the Park Police, which is actually very active in patrolling our national parks and the monuments, the Capitol Police, many of them, uh, you all are probably very familiar with them, especially after January 6th. Um, but um, then when I became U.S. attorney, I learned about agencies that I had not worked with before, like the Smithsonian has a police department of its own. Um, and so there are many, many different agencies here. Um, but again, I think on the local side, MPD is the agency that worked with the most. On the federal side, we tended to probably work more so with them. I'm going to ask both of you to weigh in on this topic, and I'm going to start with you and then go to you, Greg. Uh, we've seen reports recently that um, the U.S. Attorney's Office currently, uh, declines about two-thirds of the people that your department arrests. And that declination or decline rate has gone up from about 31 percent during the Obama administration to the high 40s when you were uh, the chief prosecutor, and now is at about 66 percent. Um, there's always a story behind the numbers, and I want to ask you first, Jesse, uh, why is that declination rate going up, and what are the factors that we should be thinking about as we look behind those numbers? Um, I don't have an answer to why the declination rate is going up. I can speculate a little bit because, you know, we talked about the time when we were in the office together, um, and there were some real differences and many more challenges, I think, to prosecuting crime in the district. Um, when I came back to the U.S. Attorney's Office. So my first stint was in the office was 02 to 06. I don't know if you have stats for that far back. It's like ancient history. Um, and then I returned to the office in 2017, and I was there through 2020 as the U.S. Attorney. Um, and again, I'd love to hear a Detective Pemberton's view on this, but what I saw was, first of all, um, between those two stints, um, there was um, a significant change in the drug laws. There was decriminalization of the possession of marijuana. And when I was a line prosecutor, a lot of marijuana arrests led to other charges, like a search incident to arrest, for example, might um, reveal a gun or some other contraband. Um, detecting marijuana might serve as reasonable cause for a search that would turn up, you know, some other offense. Um, that no longer is the case. I don't know whether MPD still makes arrests um, it, that are in some way tied to marijuana, which ultimately is determined, you know, not to form the basis for, for uh, probable cause to search. Um, and um, it's, I think, also the case that the discovery obligations on prosecutors have um, expanded significantly. Um, there's lots more electronic evidence than there was uh, 20 years ago. MPD has um, implemented, uh, I guess, five or six years ago, um, a body-worn camera 
program, and that means that even for a misdemeanor arrest, you'll have at least several officers come to the scene and uh, have their body cameras on, and all of that is discoverable. And so the burden, if you will, of complying with discovery obligations for prosecutors, it's much, much greater. Um, and so it may be just a resource um, constraint because the resources that go into prosecuting uh, a misdemeanor in the District of Columbia now, I think, are significantly greater than when we started in the office, Cully. It used to be the case that you were able to basically pick up a misdemeanor file and take it to trial very, very quickly mm -hmm. with preparation. If you were lucky and maybe like, you know, somewhat a, a, a reasonable amount of preparation, that's, that, it, that's now much more resource intensive, so that could be the reason. But you know, I wish I had a better answer for you um, in terms of declination rates, but I just don't know uh, the answer. It would be certainly a valuable piece of information if we could get to that answer. Well, um, Greg, it works, great. Um, you saw that the press put that question to the current U.S. Attorney's Office head. They gave an answer. They mentioned body-worn cameras. They mentioned uh, labs uh, taking time uh, to uh, test forensic evidence, et cetera. But you have a more granular understanding because you represent over 3,000, or three, right, lots, yeah. lots, lots, lots yeah. of police. So tell, tell us your thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and what well, Jesse's absolutely right about some of the burdens that have, have built up over the years and some of the changes in the laws. But, uh, and again, it's, it's hard to say the why, but uh, what I can say is that uh, over time, uh, the threshold for, for what is the, a case that we call gets papered, which is processed and, and prosecuted, uh, has, has gone up quite a bit. Uh, initially, I would say even as recently as five years ago, an officer or detective would bring in a case to the prosecutor's office, and um, it was based on probable cause. That's what the standard of proof is to arrest or, or to get an arrest warrant. Uh, and, and at that point in time, it would be between the prosecutor and the detective or the officer to, to decide how they were going to develop uh, a case that could be prosecutable that had beyond a reasonable doubt. And, and typically, the way we did that was through the grand jury process, was to bring in witnesses and bring in officers and, and present evidence, get an indictment in that case, and then once that indictment was achieved, you move into the court system and actually prosecute that case. And, and there was there was sort of a, a step level that you'd come in with probable cause, you'd sort of build up to that beyond a reasonable doubt as you got to that indictment. And now I think it feels like there's much more of a requirement that, that those cases be brought kind of with a bow on them, that the prosecutors are looking for that beyond a reasonable doubt at that intake level. And so I think what our officers and our detectives are seeing is that a lot of these cases are getting dismissed uh, at that intake phase just because they don't have quite every element that would be needed at trial, uh, which is frustrating because, because I think um, the way to build those good criminal prosecutions is through that grand jury process and, and to develop that evidence to get to trial. And I think what we've seen is kind of a, a raising of the bar, if you will. Yeah, and one of the things we talked about to put this in the context of a, of a hypothetical real case is you guys would roll up on a suspect in a car who's in, uh, breaking traffic laws. You stop them. There's four people in the car. You see uh, open beer can, you see uh, drugs, and then you find a gun, uh, either in the center console or on the floor. Back in the day when we were there, uh, you'd charge all four of them. You'd bring that to papering. You'd, you'd paper, in other words, you'd fill out charges for all four of them. Uh, and then eventually we would take it to the grand jury. Uh, if something developed between the time you use arrest and the time the grand jury happened, we made declined to charge one or two of them. You would then get the uh, DNA tested, if there are any, or fingerprints on the gun, and you would move forward towards a trial. That doesn't happen today this way, does it? No, that, that's correct, and that's, that, that is the way that we used to do it, is sort of prosecute everybody or charge everybody uh, and, and allow that grand jury process to sort itself out. And, and the U.S. Attorney's Office has taken a different approach as of late, which is that none of those people uh, were getting papered at intake. So officers would stop a car, there'd be uh, one or two weapons in the car, everyone in the car would get arrested, and the U.S. Attorney's Office would then no paper the case because... Uh, it's hard to say exactly who was in possession of that weapon. Uh, so now the department has taken a new approach, which is that you know no one gets arrested, uh, and we go back and try to process that weapon, process that vehicle, uh, interview witnesses or interview suspects, and try to determine who who was responsible for possessing that weapon, uh, and then bring a warrant at a later time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, give the folks here a sense of 
the area of responsibility and the scale of the area of responsibility for the de police department. The uh, city is divided into seven districts, police districts. Within each district, as you know, Jesse, because you did so many community meetings as the U.S. Attorney, there are police service areas, PSA, so little chunks of each of the seven parts. Um, violent crime, especially homicides, are really concentrated in a very small number of those PSAs. Uh, let's look at the current crime data uh, that I'll pull up. Well, that's not it. Uh, that's not it. That's it. Uh, this is your uh, crime data uh, watch page that's up every day. It's updated every day. Um, explain what we're looking at. The previous panel talked about spikes, of course, in uh, uh, auto motor vehicle threat theft, which you see is way up. Um, homicides are up uh, 10%. Uh, that's actually off by one, one point now because I think it changed as of today. That's the 22nd. Today's the 23rd. Tell us what we're looking at and what stands out to you and the officers you represent. So the, these are citywide stats, and, and what they're showing in that first column is, is where we were this time last year with each one of those crime categories and where we are today, and then it's showing you the percentage change. So, you know, for example, we're up 10% on homicides, 111% on sex abuse, 105% uh, on motor vehicle theft, and then at the bottom you can see that the all-crime total is, is up 22%. Um, you know, what's been happening... Uh, at least for the past few years, going back to I think 2020 is really uh, where where we would place the marker. Uh, significant staffing shortages on the Metropolitan Police Department side, and as well as significant changes legislatively to the criminal justice system, uh, which has has prevented us from really holding criminals accountable, particularly in the violent crime categories. So we're, we're losing police officers uh, at a time when the demand is going up. So the number of 911 calls is going up. The number of reports that need to be taken are going up. Uh, and the number of police officers we have to staff those demands is going down. And at the same time, we have a criminal justice system that's eroding through legislative actions on on how we can hold criminals accountable uh, and, and some of the prosecutorial issues that we've, we've discussed. So uh, it, what this is creating is um, less accountability for criminals. There's a lot of recidivism, uh, a lot of criminals that were catching 5, 10, 15, 20 times arresting for the same, same uh, crime over and over again. Uh, even though they're going to trial, they're being convicted or they're pleading, pleading guilty, uh, we're not seeing any significant sentences that is actually removing them from the community long enough to, to make an impact. So I want to stay on this particular aspect uh, of, of the program because I think it's really important for people to not just hear the broad brush comments, which are helpful to hear, but get specific. So if we look at, for example, um, the next chart, this is the 20-year homicide trend. Um, and who's committing these crimes, uh, and why are these numbers going up? And then, Jesse, I'd like you to weigh in during your time if you can, you can sort of sense more from the charts than just the numbers show. So what we're looking at here is it's sort of a reverse chart going from 2022 all the way back to 2003. It's the total number of homicides the district has seen every year. Uh, and if you start in 2003, you have this 248 number, uh, the highest number that's up there. And then there's this precipitous drop uh, moving through the, two, the early 2000s, which got us down to 88 in 2012. And then if you look at the most recent 10 years, it starts to climb back up. It stays in around that 100 number, but as you get towards 2017, 2018, the number starts to creep back up in the 160s and then the 190s. And now the past two years, uh, we've obviously climbed over the 200 mark again. Uh, and as you, as you saw from the previous slide, uh, we're up 10% on those numbers again. Uh, so without any significant changes, we'll likely uh, and tragically see another number above 200 this year. Uh, who's committing these crimes? Uh, again, this is uh, at the chief of police uh, said at a press conference just I think a few weeks ago that the average homicide suspect in the district has been arrested 11 times prior to being arrested for the homicide. And so again, what we're seeing is this criminal justice system that's not being effective in terms of removing violent persons from the community or rehabilitating folks in a way that, that prevents them from, from recidivating in, in these type of crimes. So um, th this is how the violence is escalating. And again, uh, you know, not having the proper number of police officers, the proper number of detectives, being able to dig in and investigate all of these crimes where we 
we can actually figure out who's responsible for them and then bring those cases into the U.S. Attorney's Office in an effective way. Uh, you know, it's just allowing this situation to exacerbate. Yeah, and Jesse, I'm sure you heard Chief Conti's comment. I mean, when I heard it, I said, yeah, because that's my experience when I was in the homicide division of the U.S. Attorney's. I, I can't remember what divisions you cycled through when you were aligned at USA, but I'm sure that was not a surprising statistic for you either, was it? No, I mean, when I was there, I mean, um, I came back to the office in 2017. The numbers were already creeping up, and, mm -hmm. and uh, we were keeping a very, very close eye on them. Um, it's very disappointing um, to see that they continue to rise. Um, but, you know, I think one huge issue is, frankly, a lack of accountability for uh, individuals who have been arrested or charged or convicted um, of crimes before they're arrested or charged with homicide because you very rarely see a situation where a homicide perpetrator um, hasn't had some level of uh, criminal history before. Um, and I did a lot of community meetings uh, when I was U.S. attorney, so I went out um, usually a couple of times a week um, into the communities with a particular focus on communities that were hard hit by violent crime to listen to people. Um, and um, I have to admit, I was surprised when I first began doing those meetings at how much I heard from uh, residents um, in the communities I visited complaining about how people um, were arrested and then back on um, the street or back in the neighborhood the next day. They felt like they were not being held accountable, um, and then eventually something really bad would happen. And I acknowledge that there may be a little bit um, of inherent bias built in because people who come to see the U.S. attorney talk may be a little bit more um, geared towards certain you know, views on, on criminal justice than, than people who don't. But nonetheless, I heard that a lot. Is like, why is it that the system is not... Um, holding people accountable um, once they're arrested and convicted. And, you know, you know I was on uh, public record uh, several years ago opposing an initiative of the D.C. Council to um, allow individuals who had been convicted of uh, certain crimes and served at least 15 years um, uh, who were young when they were convicted to have a, a second look um, at their sentences because I was very concerned about what that might do um, to the violent crime rate in the community um, and that it did not take the views of victims into account. But um, you know, I do think that um, there, uh, there have been a whole range of, of challenges to the police and to prosecutors um, and within the court system as well over the last, let's say, you know, 10 years or so that have um, um, presented real challenges for, for the safety of the community. I want to get to the um, shooting trend, the 10-year shooting trend slide, which is the next slide, Greg. But is there anything you want to add to what Jesse just said? Uh, you know, I agree with Jesse here that there's, there's a lot. This is a systemic issue that, that's going on. But uh, at, at the core of it, uh, th it, this is just an example of the criminal justice system failing in the district. We, it, if we're at a place in 2012 where we're down to 88 homicides, uh, and then 10 years later we're at 236 homicides, uh, some, something's not working. Uh, and this next slide, I think, will will show sort of how that trend has changed uh, dramatically. Yeah, and it's important for everyone to understand that violent crime and crime trends have been going down across the country for 30 years. I mean, the high spike, the last peak was 1992. And one of the main reasons that they've had a 30-year decline for the most part until recently is actual, real reform, progressive-minded people created drug courts, domestic violence courts, family justice centers, hundreds of alternatives to incarceration, use a carrot and stick approach. And then violent criminals who got convicted of the worst crimes had to go to prison for long periods of time. And this is the combination of things that led to that. This slide, I want to talk about, you can see this, the, the numbers speak for themselves. This is the 10-year... Um, shooting trend. Obviously, it's going up. You go from left to right, 2014 to 2022. But let me talk about a tool that, in my opinion, is not being used enough and could be started today. And that is under 18 U.S.C. 922G. Sorry to be lawyer on you all for a second. <laughs> but if you're a felon and you're caught with a weapon, you can be prosecuted in federal district court under 922G and you get a five-year minimum sentence. So, Greg, 
question for you, and then Jesse, feel free to pile on if you want to. If today the U.S. Attorney's Office, every U.S. Attorney's Office, but in D.C. in particular, said, you know what, every ex-felon who's caught in possession of a handgun or a weapon is going to go to federal district court, what would the effect be, and what's happening now instead? Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. And, and one thing I've always been frustrated with is a lot of elected officials in the district um, you know, comment on illegal guns and how we need to take illegal guns seriously and, and eradicate uh, illegal guns. And then the problem is we're arresting people who are in possession of illegal, illegal guns, and they're just not being prosecuted in any way that's significant. Uh, but what you're talking about is taking these folks that they're convicted felons, there is a law in the books that says if you're caught with an illegal gun as a convicted felon, then you can get tried in federal court, which carries a five-year mandatory minimum. I think that sends a huge immediate signal to people in the district that are willing to commit these kind of crimes uh, to say, I don't know that I'm willing to take that risk. And I think you really could have a significant impact if the prosecutors and, and the elected officials in D.C. took those kind of crimes more seriously as, as they claim to. Um, but your second part of the question is what's happening now? Well, uh, when someone's arrested with an illegal gun in the district, there This happens every day. Oh, every day. Every, every day. day people are arrested with guns in the district, uh, and they're charged in D.C. Superior Court as what we call CPWL, which is carrying a pistol without a license, which is a Superior Court charge. Uh, and ultimately, even if those people plead guilty or are convicted, they're not seeing any kind of significant sentence. A lot of the sentencing that we're seeing in, in the CPWL category is probation only, six months, 12 months, 18 months probation. Uh, people aren't actually even seeing the inside of a jail for carrying an illegal gun in the District of Columbia, even when they already are convicted felons. So it's just not a charge that the city is taking seriously. And one way to take it seriously is what you suggested, which is to take those charges to, to federal court. And you tried to do just that. I did. And tell us what I happened. I did. Um, so when I was the U.S. attorney, we started a, a program to take more um, 922 G cases to federal court. Um, Pemberton, you probably remember that effort. Um, but we began by, the goal was eventually to bring all of the 922 G felon in possession cases, charge them as 922 G federal cases in district court. We began with a focus on the parts of the city that were most um, affected by violent crime. Um, and the reason was not actually primarily focused on sentencing. There were a couple of other benefits, I thought, to bringing these cases in federal court. One was that we could tap the resources of the FBI and the ATF so that we could bring more resources to bear. MPD uh, is, is a fantastic uh, law enforcement organization, um, but stretched pretty thin. I think you'd probably agree. Um, and um, the other um, aspect was that because we were treating these as federal cases and bringing in federal assistance for investigating, we could do more, I thought, than just prosecute a case here and a case there. We could look to see um, connections among um, it, defendants. We could try to figure out whether there was um, a um, uh, network um, of, of uh, gun traffickers from whom people were getting their guns. We were trying to get intelligence on where the gun's coming from. It's sort of like a drug trafficking investigation. It's important to um, address the issue of individual drug deals or individual drug possession, but you also want to know, ultimately, I think as the senator was saying earlier, where where's the, the dangerous thing, whether it's a drug from across the border or whether it's gun guns coming from somewhere else. There are no guns. We used to say this all the time. There are no guns that are manufactured in the District of Columbia. We'll put aside 3D printed guns and ghost guns and that sort of thing right now. But for the most part, they're coming in from somewhere else. Um, and we wanted to develop that kind of intelligence so that not only were we addressing individual possessions in the district, but also addressing trafficking. And so that was part of the goal. Um, I will say, um, and I think this is very much a, a matter of public record, that uh, that effort met with a lot of opposition um, from certain quarters um, for various reasons. And um, you know, I still think that this is a, a good technique that should be you know, considered pretty seriously. Obviously, you can tweak it in different ways to address whatever the circumstances are on the ground at the time. But um, the collaboration between the MPD 
and the federal authorities um, and the effort to try to address this as a bigger problem, I think, is something that's well worth pursuing. Well, Jesse, you made the cardinal mistake of trying to apply the 922G prosecutions to the places where the guns were found in the districts where they were found, right? Yes, I thought yeah. that was, I mean, I would frankly be, I, you know, we, we ultimately, I would have liked to apply them across the board. That increases the number right. of um, prosecutions a lot, but because of resource constraints, my goal was, well, where are we gonna focus? And I wanna focus on the neighborhoods that are most beset by violent gun crime. Right, which is pretty common sense. Uh, and I understand uh, from reading and of course knowing you that, that uh, eventually you did apply it across the seven uh, police districts. Of course, you know, you're not going to find hardly any in 1D, 2D, 3D, et cetera. But one of the persons, uh, offices that opposed it was the city attorney, which in D.C. is called the AG, uh, Carl Racine, opposes USA prosecution of local gun cases in federal court as if D.C. is not part of a federal district. And his news release is April 22nd, 2020, for those of you who want to uh, look it up. Um, let's switch our focus slightly um, to carjackings. Um, that's been in the news a lot. Um, as Zach said in the previous panel, as of today, there's been 1,505 uh, thefts, auto thefts or carjackings. It's up 104%, Greg, from last year. What's going on? Who's doing this? And why do they keep doing it? Yeah, again, and, and looking at this chart, uh, you can see those bars at the top are monthly carjackings. And so you can see that, you know, for several years there, we had this kind of nominal number. And then you get to this 2020 time frame, and all of a sudden these numbers just skyrocket off the charts. And, and you can see if you look down in the lower right-hand corner, it says that carjackings are up 11% over last year, which was – uh, an incredible increase last year. We're, we're already at 130 carjackings just barely three months into the year. You know, it's almost two per day. Uh, I think last year we had something like 550 carjackings. Uh, you know, four years ago, I think it was rare that the number exceeded 100. Uh, and this, these numbers don't seem to be going anywhere. So what, one thing that we're seeing a lot of uh, in, in this particular crime category is juveniles, is people under the age of 18 who are, who are using weapons, they're stopping people in vehicles, they're forcibly dragging them out or threatening them and, and then taking their vehicle. And then the vehicle ends up being used in a whole host of other crimes throughout the city, and then it usually ends up dumped somewhere with all kinds of damage to it. Uh, but uh, this is definitely a problem that is not being addressed, and, and one of the issues is, is again, uh, the fact that this, the, there is no accountability for the folks that we're catching and charging and convicting uh, in this crime category, which is obviously a serious issue, and, and I don't think that the court system is taking this very seriously. Well, I do want to talk about the juvenile crime problem in the city in a little bit later, but I first want to uh, just touch on the so-called reforms that were passed by uh, the city council and rejected by everybody else. Um, the, and I have a chart on that, which I guess I can zip forward to so people can see it. Um, that's it. Um, the current law, Greg and Jesse, has a mandatory minimum of seven years and a max of 21 years for conviction of first degree carjacking. That's assuming it's obviously taken to superior court. If the D.C. City Council's so-called reforms uh, had not been rejected, that new law uh, would have allowed a convicted carjacker to get zero time in prison, no mandatory minimum at all. Um, what signal would that have sent? Uh, well, the, the obvious signal is that you can get away with these crimes. Uh, you know, one of the problems that we had with this revised Criminal Code Act is that the sentencing guidelines that currently exist aren't being followed in, in any significant way. So people who are actually being uh, charged with armed carjacking and convicted of armed carjacking are seeing very minimal, lenient sentences. And so to then come back and reduce the maximum sentences, even though they're not being relied upon at all, sends a message that uh, the sentences are going to get even more lenient. And uh, unfortunately, th that's... Um, that's not a path to reducing the, the number of crimes in this category. You know, thankfully, as, as Senator Haggerty stated, this was a successful uh, operation to, to disapprove this, 
uh, legislation, which would have been absolutely catastrophic for the city. Uh, but the message that it would have sent was that you, you're, you're not going to receive any significant sentence for an armed carjacking. Jesse, you want to weigh in? I, w I just want to add to that that um, you know, this these provisions apply to defendants who are charged as adults, right? So, um, and, and um, so even even on top of what Greg just mentioned, um, and you probably know much more about this in terms of stats, there are a very significant number of carjackings that are committed by juveniles. Um, and some of them are quite young. Uh, there's currently authority for the U.S. Attorney's Office to charge 16 and 17 year olds who commit carjackings um, under something called Title 16, which would treat them as adults in superior court. Um, but individuals who are younger than that are charged as, as juveniles. And there's obviously a lot that we can talk about from a policy perspective and a legal perspective with respect to um, charging uh, young folks um, uh, as adults or not charging them as adults. But I just want to point that out, that um, there are a lot of carjackings and other violent crimes, too, that are convicted, committed by people under the age of 18 and, uh, for the most part, are charged under a different statutory regime. Well, let's, let's since we drifted into the juvenile front, let's just stay there. Um, the U.S. Attorney's Office of the District of Columbia does not handle juvenile crimes. Those are handled by the city attorney, in other words, the attorney general's office. And for the most part, for the most except part. for those that are um, that are taken to superior court under the Title 16 framework. Yeah. So let's let's talk about that because Greg and I, you and I talked about this beforehand. Um, what is your experience and that of your fellow officers for uh, the vast majority of juveniles who commit violent crimes here in the district, including uh, crimes with guns, violent crimes with guns, uh, armed carjackings, armed robberies, stealing these kind of ju goose jackets off of people, pistol whipping people. Um, where are their cases handled and how, what are the dispositions of these cases? And when they serve their time, where do they serve their time? Because this, I think, could be shocking to people. Yeah, that, that's a great question. So, so uh, juveniles uh, are charged by the Office of the Attorney General, which is a, a local office here in D.C., as, as Jesse mentioned. Um, and th that office subscribes to this restorative justice model. And the idea of the restorative justice model is that incarceration is not the answer for juveniles who've committed crimes, even violent crimes, up to and including homicide. Uh, and, and the problem with that approach is that the Office of the Attorney General here in D.C. uses it as a blanket, that anyone that comes in the system and is charged for violent crimes and is a juvenile uh, will be treated under this restorative justice model. Now, it, I wouldn't suggest by any stretch of the imagination that every juvenile that's arrested for a crime you know, needs to be thrown in jail. Um, or thrown under the jail. But there, there has to be some understanding that some juveniles will benefit from a restorative justice type model where there is some learning and some opportunity for them to go back and, and correct their behavior. But there are also other juveniles who are not going to respond to that and are going to take advantage of a system that does not hold them accountable in any meaningful way. And, and I think that's one of the most uh, critical comments I can make about the OAG is that they sort of have this this Office blank. of Attorney General, I'm the sorry. local city attorney. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Um, they, they have this philosophy that any juvenile that comes in, all 100% you know, of the juveniles that come in to the system need to be treated under this restorative justice model. Uh, I, I think that's a huge mistake, and I think that there are, are juveniles that are engaged in repetitive, violent criminal behavior and are not being held accountable. Um, and one of the things that we find frustrating is even when a juvenile is charged and convicted for a violent crime, and then the within judge, the juvenile system, within the juvenile system, and is is sentenced to to some amount of time. Let's say that it's a five year sentence. That sentence is typically served at home. They're typically sent home, and then the service of the five years of quote unquote incarceration is actually served in in a more what we would think of as a probationary status or a parole status, where someone is at home. They're checking in with a supervisor. They have certain tasks they have to complete, but they're not removed from society, and and that uh, it allows them to recidivate over and over again. And then each time they come back in the system, even when they're in this this uh, status where they're serving another sentence, they're still treated under this restorative justice model. Uh, and I think that's one of the main reasons why you see numbers for armed carjacking skyrocketing, because it's the same kids over and over and over again who are not being held accountable. And, and just to be clear, 
every state has juvenile justice systems. Uh, the, the operating principle for the juvenile court system and juvenile justice system in the 50 states is that uh, young people are rehabilitatable, they should be given a second chance, that for most of them uh, can be rehabilitated, and that's perfectly appropriate, obviously. And if they're sent to adult court, they should serve, and, and prosecuted and convicted in adult court, they should serve their time in a juvenile detention facility until they reach the date of age of adulthood. So I don't think there's any controversy on that. But is, was it your experience, Jesse, that uh, what Greg is talking about today was happening when you were there? Because my sense when we were uh, line prosecutors is, is the, that there weren't as many juveniles committing violent crimes. And we didn't, I think I handled a few of assault with intent to kill 17 year olds, but not many. What was your sense of when you were there? I can only offer kind of a, um, I don't have like hard statistics. My mm -hmm. sense when I was in the office was that um, certain crimes, violent crimes committed by juveniles was on the rise. Carjackings was an example, robberies was another example. Um, I had the sense that there, you know, homicides by juveniles may have been on the rise too. And my kind of general sense, again, I don't have the data, maybe you do, Cully, but I felt like in the last few years that that seems to have increased, carjackings in, in particular. But I know when I was in the office, um, there was starting to be a real concern about robberies and carjackings by juveniles in, in particular. And of course, this is the gang recruiting tool that gangs in, around the country use is that they uh, know that if the juvenile does the dirty work, does the murder, does this, and if they get held accountable, that they'll come out at 21 years old from the juvenile facility and they're full-fledged members of the gang. I looked at um, some other states, uh, and one in particular where I worked as California as a prosecutor. When, uh, under their law, if a juvenile commits a murder under special circumstances, rape by force or other sex crimes by force, they are automatically tried as adults. So the juvenile prosecutors have no say on it, it just gets charged, it's a direct file. Uh, and then in cases of murder, attempted murder, other sex crimes, kidnapping, ag assault while armed, uh, and manslaughter, they qualify to be tried as adults, and there's a hearing to ter determine whether they are fit to stay in, adult, in, in juvenile court or whether they go uh, to uh, adult court. Is it your sense, Greg, that the um, OAG, the city attorney here for the district, holds on to those cases as much as they can, or do they cede to the U.S. Attorney's Office the right number of folks who are committing violent crimes to go to adult court? No, I, I think the, the Office of the Attorney General here um, it, it tries to make sure that as many people as possible go through this restorative justice model. I, I, it's my, and again, this is anecdotal, but I, I, I believe that um, their efforts are to keep those juveniles underneath their umbrella and their prosecutorial umbrella. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to that. I'm obviously not here to talk about home rule or um, any of the issues related to it, but I will just say that I think there, there. When I was there, anyway, my my sense was that although Carl Racine and I had a good working relationship, that there was um, some inherent tension between mm -hmm. the office of the attorney general and the U.S. attorney's office. Um, because the existence of the U.S. Attorney's Office and the U.S. Attorney's Office's role in prosecuting what normally would be local crimes um, was um, antithetical to, um, to some of the principles of home rule that, that home rule adherents very firmly believe in. And so there was, I mean, and always I think has been for a good number of years, kind of a tension between uh, you know, there are many people who think that there ought not to be a U.S. attorney in the district who prosecutes local crimes mm -hmm. and that those crimes should be handled by um, a locally elected prosecutor. And that's, a, um, you know, obviously a, a huge policy and political um, issue that's beyond what we're here to talk about. But it is a backdrop, I think, behind all of these um, discussions. And that was certainly the case the day we were hired. I mean, we knew about that tension that people wanted a local DA elected to handle the local crimes and then the U.S. Attorney's Office would be small and just handle those select number of cases that would go to federal district court. Um, let's talk about hiring. Uh, since you were the head cheese, you were the boss, you had the final say uh, when you were the U.S. Attorney's um, uh, Give us this, this sort of your understanding of, well, I, I won't 
talk about what happens now because I don't know what Matt Graves does and you're not speaking for the department. But when you were there, and generally your knowledge now, what are the types of profiles of people who get hired into that office? So, and I, and I say, and I ask that question because when I was a prosecutor in San Diego, when I was a homicide prosecutor in Maryland, the people who would apply to those offices were gung-ho, law and order, I want to prosecute types. My sense is that's not the type of person that the office hires these days. I'm not asking you to comment on that, but when you were the U.S. attorney, what were the general buckets that they would fall into, the people you would hire? Um, so when I, I, in every U.S. attorney, I think has a slightly different um, philosophy about hiring and how to staff the office. My view was um, basically kind of two buckets of people's professional backgrounds at the risk of generalization, Cully. Right. Um, the, uh, about you know half of the AUSAs when I was there were assigned to Superior Court, and that's a huge part of the office's um, uh, responsibility. So I wanted to find people who um, had experience um, in state court if possible, but perhaps even more important than that, wanted to be handling the kinds of cases that were being handled in um, superior court. So people, for example, who had served in the Commonwealth's attorney's office or the state's attorney's office or the DA's office in another state. Um, we hired a lot of people coming out of the JAG Corps who had done a lot of uh, violent crime trials, often on both sides. Um, yep, um, we all did. And exactly, um, which I think is a, is a very interesting and a model that gives a lot of perspective to the people who come out of that background. Um, and then, um, the, the office also handles a lot of um, crimes on the federal district court side, and you know they're um, so I would hire you know people who um, maybe had a, a federal court clerkship before or had done work on the federal district court um, side when they were in private practice and that sort of thing. But for me, the most important thing in hiring anybody was to hire someone who wanted to do the job. And my view of the job is that, yes, of course, every individual case has to be evaluated on its own facts and it's on its own merits. But we are fundamentally, um, we're a prosecutor's office and you, know, you need to want to do the kind of work that the office does. Um, there are many other players within the criminal justice system, and I think that they all have honorable roles, but if you don't want to do the prosecutorial work, then it may not be a good fit. Probably isn't a good fit. Yeah. Greg, you want to weigh in on this? Uh, yeah, so let me give it some context. I, I became a detective, a violent crimes detective in 2008, um, and, and I remember that it seemed to me that the vast majority of prosecutors in that office were were aggressive. They, they wanted to take the cases, they wanted to make cases, they wanted to bring cases in front of court, they wanted to argue in front of judges and juries. Uh, I think over the past 15 years or whatever that time frame has been, um, it, it seems to me that, that the office has lost a little bit of its teeth in, in that respect and that um, I don't think you see the same sort of fervor from, from the typical rank and file or, or line, line prosecutor about that. Uh, it's hard for me to say why or whether that's about hiring or just a, a culture shift within the agency. And again, it's not, you know, I don't work there. I only work with them. Uh, but I, I definitely can say that from our experience as, as rank and file officers and detectives that it, it seems like there's been a decline in the um, the desire to go out and actually uh, aggressively prosecute cases. So all uh, can I add one please. thing, yep. which is just to share some perspective that I heard a lot from line prosecutors in the office when I was there. Um, but I had a number of people say, you know, I took this job because I wanted to be the good guy. Um, I wanted to be the person looking out for the victims, and I wanted to be the person wearing the white hat. And um, then I got into the work and I found that I was um, kind of vilified um, and um, the subject of very, very harsh criticism all the time. And there were a lot of people who were quite beaten down um, by the job and feeling like they were constantly under attack, sometimes kind of personally um, under attack. Um, and I think that's unfortunate because um, I, I do think that um, Generally speaking, prosecutors, and you saw this, of course, when you were in the office, are really committed to doing the right thing um, and are working really hard to do the right thing, and not just for the prosecutor's office or for the detectives or for the victims, but to doing the right thing overall. Um, 
And I, I think that um, there's a lot of criticism out there, both police and prosecutors, and it makes it very, very hard for people. It's hard enough um, to do those jobs, I think, um, feeling as though um, you know those jobs are, are under attack um, makes it even harder. Uh, yeah. and so I think a lot of people are either reluctant to take them or um, you know, looking for a way out. Yeah, and in my experience in the four or five prosecutor's offices I've been in, the U.S. attorneys for the D.C. office uh, was a very uh, difficult and demoralizing office to work in because you had superior court judges who were not completely uh, keen on prosecutors. You had to stand in line with all the defendants to get into the courthouse and be wanted like any other person. Uh, the office was many, off, many blocks away from the Superior Court and the Federal District Court. Now it's been booted out of triple nickel, the, their current address, and shoved into a small space in the Patrick Henry building. Uh, the public defenders and others are accused the prosecutors of Brady violations in almost every case. I mean, that was not done in the other places where I've been a prosecutor. And so you can see why people would be like, geez. Um, it was still a privilege to stand up and represent the United States government. And oh, I, think, I think there's no greater privilege. Right, right, and, 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 and awesome, important responsibilities. Um, all of these topics that we've talked about, Greg, uh, today, the previous panel and then our discussion, has had a real impact uh, on morale and then staffing. And in fact, I want to see if the folks who are helping me can go backwards in the slides, because I'm not sure I know how to work the button backwards. Um, and look at the staffing uh, chart. Um, you've told me that uh, there are about 2,000 911 calls per day <laughs> in the city. There are about 250,000 police reports taken per year from traffic accidents uh, to murders. And you've noted that crime has been increasing uh, over the past uh, five years. And you also said um, that um, walk us through the numbers on on MPD staffing because this is this is really significant. I mean, it started going down in 2011, right? That's when right. When Kathy yeah. Lanier testified in front of the city council, right? That That's said correct. We yeah. should be around 3,800. Tell us more about this and what the what what has happened as a result of this combination of events. So on this chart, and, and you can see that it, it's, it starts to fall around that 2011 time, but then it, it plateaus off. But then you see this real precipitous, uh, precipitous drop, excuse me, uh, right around 2020, 2021. Uh, and, and that's a, right around the time that the city council, um, as you heard the senator, senator talking about earlier, began um, introducing and passing a lot of legislation that affected police officers police officers working conditions, their ability to do their job, um, and, and also they legislated a number of things that dealt with uh, criminal justice and, and prosecutions, which just made the job untenable for a lot of people. Um, so, it, I mean, going back to, to 2020, we've lost over 1,200 police officers in that amount of time, and I think the department's only been able to replace 700. You know, the chief of police testified in, in an oversight hearing last month that we're short over 500 police officers, which, you know, you've been talking about the districts throughout. There's seven police districts. That's the equivalent of losing two entire police districts. Um, and not not only is losing that amount of officers a problem, but you have you have to take it in consideration with the fact that the demand has gone up. That as crime goes up, that that's more demand, more 911 calls, more reports to be taken, more cases to be investigated, uh, and and with a dwindling number of police, the demand on each individual employee goes up. Uh, so the, the as you say, morale, um, you know, it's just in the tank because it, officers feel like they cannot go out and do their job no matter how badly they want to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tessie, you want to weigh in? I don't have a whole lot to add. I agree with uh, everything that Greg said, um, and uh, you know, certainly saw it when I was in the office. Um, it well, maybe is you could really talk about job. what you heard in the hundreds of community meetings you went to, because you were really known for being out in the community a lot. We have a lot of friends who are still community prosecutors in that office, and you really had the reputation of listening to the people. What did you hear from people in those communities? You mentioned they were self-selecting, but they lived there and you didn't and I didn't. So what were they saying about fewer police, more police, et cetera? 
I will say that overall, um, I heard much more along the lines of we wish there were more policing or like sort of more um, MPD presence in the neighborhoods um, in which um, the people that I was talking to lived than, than less. Um, and sometimes I would hear very specific things like there was something going on you know, in this particular block, and why was it that nobody come, came to do anything about it? We called a couple of times. A lot of times we heard this um, in commentary about, well, like, you know, there are people who are causing, um, committing crimes in the neighborhood, they're dealing drugs in the neighborhood, even when they get arrested, they're released the next day. Why isn't something being done about that? Um, a lot of concern about, um, the inability of children who live in the neighborhood to mm. feel safe walking back and forth from school or to feel safe playing in a playground um, without encountering potential violence or um, drug trafficking. And so um, I, I heard quite a bit when I was in the community about just what more um, you know, can, can law enforcement do. Mm -hmm. We have about three minutes left. Um, Greg, how does this get fixed? Um, you mentioned 922 G cases going to federal district court. Um, they have an immediate impact. What else, within reason um, and doable in the next few years, should we be thinking about, should Congress be thinking about, should the city council be thinking about uh, in terms of getting their arms around lowering violent crime and crime rates in general in the city? Yeah, uh, my thought on this is that it's, uh, I don't think there's a panacea here. I mean, there, this is a holistic issue. I think every aspect of the criminal justice system is, is broken on some level, whether that's uh, policing, prosecutions, uh, the judicial system, uh, incarceration, or, or even the supervision programs that we have. I think there's aspects of each one of those uh, that, that need serious attention. Um, and unless we're sort of approaching it holistically, we're looking at all of them, um, I think it's going to take a long time to fix. But uh, you know, ultimately at the heart of all this is uh, this sort of front line, which is police officers who have to respond to these calls and, and conduct an investigation and collect evidence and bring these cases into the system. Without them, uh, you know, everything down, down the stream is not, uh, is not going to do its job. So I think the main thing that we need to be focusing on is police staffing. Uh, I think there's been a lot of rhetoric for the past few years about defunding and reducing police and reinvesting um, I, without having the proper number of police to address the demand that's out there. Uh, I, I don't think that we're going to be able to fix any other downstream aspect. Yeah, and I want to add one more um, part of the criminal justice system that we haven't talked about, which is the courts. Um, the Superior Court in D.C. is a really big court. I think it's uh, got 60-something seats. When I was the U.S. attorney, it was um, there were probably 10 to 12, if not more, vacancies. Uh, there have obviously been new judges appointed, but others have retired. Um, and I, I think that um, you know we need to think about that too and make sure that the courts are fully staffed um, and well equipped um, to handle cases because um, when you don't have that staffing, um, cases don't move through the system and um, you know the old saying is justice delayed is justice denied um, and so that's a critical part too I think but you know, you've got to look at it throughout um, as Greg was saying you know on the very front end with the officers who are on patrol um, all the way through the system uh, to the judges. Great well I want to Thank you both for coming. I know we have a hard stop uh, due to another event uh, in a few minutes, uh, but uh, this is a conversation that will be continued, uh, and thank you for taking time out of both your busy days for coming by to Heritage, and please join me in thanking our guests.